In this tutorial, we're going to create a simple fabric design for the Smart Fusion 2 SOC FPGAs. I'm going to start out using Libro SOC 11.5 and I'm going to create a new project. So I'll click on New and in the New Project dialog box, it'll ask me where I want to work and I'm going to navigate out to a folder here called Micro Semi PRJ. Uh, you can work in any folder you want to work in, but I would strongly recommend that you don't work in a folder that has a space in the name. So let's give it a name. Let's just call this SF2 Fabric. And we can choose to work in either Verilog or VHDL. Uh, I'll just leave it Verilog in this case. I'll say Next. And I'm going to choose the Smart Fusion 2 device. And for this design, I'm going to choose uh, the Smart Fusion 2090. Uh, so we'll choose Smart Fusion 2. And we'll choose the uh, M2S 090 TS device. That's the device that's on our security evaluation kit. And that device is in a 484 FPGA. FPGA. Um, and we'll choose a speed grade as dash 1. You choose core voltage as 1.2. And then we'll choose commercials. So that's going to bring up our device here. Um, and uh, we'll say next. And when we come to the uh, device setting page, we can choose what we want the default I.O. technology to be, and I'm just going to leave it at 2.5 volts. Uh, reserve pins for probes. That allows me to use the special probe pins that we have for debugging. Um, and um, the PLL supply voltage uh, for the board I'm planning on targeting is 3.3 volts. So the PLLs in Smart Fusion 2 and in Igloo 2 can run at either 3.3 volts or 2.5. Uh, you just need to make sure that the software matches what you have on the board. And as I mentioned, our board has 3.3 volts, so that's what we're going to go with. Um, power on reset delay. We have a power on reset circuit, so what we're going to do is uh, put a value in here uh, that matches the ramp rate of the power supply. And we can just leave the default, in our case, of 100 milliseconds. Uh, then I'm going to say next. And here I'm going to see this page that says design template. And this is where I could uh, use uh, some special design tools we have if we're going to use the microcontroller subsystem. Uh, in our design, we're going to do just a fabric only design. So we'll just say none in this case. Uh, we'll say next. And we'll come along to a section where it will ask us if we want to import some files. And we, we've brought, provided some files in this um, tutorial. So I'm going to say import. And I'm going to navigate out to. Um, the folder that has the source files. So that's so I'll come out here to my source files and uh, I've provided uh, a file called the LED CTRL. Uh, there's a VHDL version and a Verilog version. I'm just going to choose the VHDL version. Um, and I'm finished there, so I'll say next. And I could add constraints, but uh, I don't really have any constraints that I've provided in this case. So I'll just say finish. So here in the Libro SOC IDE, on the Files tab, you can see the source file that we imported. Now, the next step, we're going to use uh, the System Builder tool. Next step, we're going to use uh, the Smart Design tool to build our design. So I'm going to open Smart Design. I can go to the Design Flow tab. I can double click on uh, Create Smart Design, and I'll give it a name, and I'll just call this Top and say OK. And I can go to the Design Hierarchy tab, and I'm going to bring this block in that we imported, this LED control block. And we're going to use that and add some other components to create our design. Now, after I've added the LED control block into the canvas, uh, I want to use some other components in Smart Fusion 2, in particular the uh, RC oscillator and the PLL to generate some clocks. So I can go to the IP catalog, and I'm going to expand clock and management, and I'm going to drag the chip oscillators, and the clock conditioning circuitry um, into the canvas. Um, a bit of advice here with the chip oscillators. There's a new version of the oscillator 1.0.105. Uh, 
uh, that's available to download to your IP vault, but that version is not compatible with Libro 11.5. It's intended to be used with Libro 11.6. Uh, you have to be careful if you use that with 11.5 because it can lead to errors. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to open the configurator first for the RC oscillator. We have different oscillators available in Smart Fusion 2. Uh, we have a main crystal oscillator circuit that works with external components to allow you to generate clock frequencies between uh, 32 kilohertz and 20 megahertz. Uh, and then we have two fixed frequency RC oscillators, a uh, 2550 megahertz RC oscillator and a one chip, a one megahertz RC oscillator. I'm going to choose to use the 2550 megahertz RC oscillator and I'm going to say it drives the fabric CCCs. Um, the fabric CCCs contain PLLs and what we're going to do here is we're going to use the PLL to generate a slow clock frequency so that we're going to clock our block with that slow clock and we're ultimately going to use it to drive LEDs on the board to make the LEDs blink. So not a real exciting design. I'm going to say OK. Uh, I'm going to open the FCCC configurator and this will let me specify the reference clock from a variety of sources. It can come from dedicated input pads, uh, it could come from a fabric input, uh, or I could use one of those oscillators. And I'm going to use the 2550 megahertz oscillator. And you notice when I choose that, it pre populates the frequency of the reference clock. Since that's a known frequency, it's only, um, only one. Uh, frequency. And then I want a slow clock in my case, so I'm just going to set it up for the slowest frequency I can set, which is uh, a half a megahertz. And I'm going to say OK. And now I need to connect the RC oscillator to the um, Fabric CCC. And I can do that just by uh, clicking on the, the output port from the oscillator and then holding the control key and clicking on the input port to the CCC, then right clicking and saying connect and we'll make those connections. Yeah, what's going to happen here is we have the PLL and the um, PLL has um, uh, dividers in the feedback path and in the uh, forward path and in this case we're going to set it up to try to divide the clock down so we'll use the dividers and you can see the divider values here. Uh, on the forward side, it's going to use a uh, divide by 2, and on the, the feedback side, it'll use divide by 32, uh, so that we're going to try to divide that clock down, and we're going to try to get, in this case, we're going to get a half a megahertz, and we can see because it tells us what the actual frequency is going to be. Um, in some cases, depending on the reference clock and the number of... Um, clocks that you're trying to generate, you may not get the exact frequency that you're asking for. Uh, but in this case, we're getting a half a megahertz. Now, half a megahertz is still pretty fast, um, but uh, we got a big counter in that LC LC LED control block that we brought in that's going to divide that clock down even further. So the reason this is a half a megahertz is this is the slowest clock we can get out of the PLL. Um, so we're going to use the PLL. Um, it gives us the opportunity to use the internal RC oscillator without needing another clock source on the board. We can use the PLL to divide it. We don't have to use the PLL. We could have put an even bigger counter in the fabric, but if we put a bigger counter in the fabric, that's going to use more fabric resources. So we might as well use the PLL, generate the slowest clock we can, but then we're going to have to divide it down further or else we'll never be able to really see the LEDs blink. They'll be going too fast. Um, and um, the next thing we can do is we can take uh, the output of our clock, this GLO, the output of the PLL, we can connect that right to the clock input of the LED control. We can move these blocks around if we want to, to just make them uh, a little bit neater. Um, we have another block that we're going to use. It's called the system reset. We have a default power and reset on these devices. And I'm going to try to bring in this sys reset block. By the way, when you're in the catalog, if you're looking for something and you're not sure where it is, if you kind of have an idea of the name, you can start typing part of the name in the filter box up here, and then it will find all of the macros that match some of those characteristics. So you notice I typed in SYS, it helped me find the sys reset. Uh, here's the sys reset block, and this is a block that's got a um, default pin assignment. There's a default dev reset 
pin on all of the devices. And this is a block that brings that input in and um, it drives out a reset for the chip. And I'm going to use that reset to reset this block. But I'm also going to um, add a gate. I'm going to gate the lock signal from the PLL. So the PLL has an active high signal that indicates when the clock, the output frequency is correct. And I'm going to gate that with the reset that comes out of the sys reset block so that I can um, reset the, the logic anytime the PLL goes out of lock. So what I want to do is I want to go into macro library and I can just drag in a two input AND gate and I'll connect an input um, from the dev reset to one of the AND gate inputs and I'll take the lock to the other one. I'll take the output of that and I'll connect it to my reset on my LED control block. Um, I have an input for a push button switch on the uh, LED control block. Um, what this is going to do is blink LEDs in a couple of different patterns. So I want to connect that to a pin and I can do that by selecting it right clicking and saying promote to top level. So when I say promote to top level, um, anything that has these little symbols like the dev reset or the PB switch port here, these are going to be uh, pins, uh, ports on the component that's created in smart design. And in this particular case, we're going to drive it. Uh, this is going to be our top level. So we're going to actually put IP IO pads in when we synthesize the design. Um, and then um, those will be connected to pins on the device and on the board the PB switch is going to connect to a, a switch that's physically on the board and the output port here the LED uh, one zero we're going to promote that to the top level and that's going to be physically connected to pins that connect to LEDs on the board. Every device has a dedicated power on reset pin and the system controller drives resets out to the chip and when you bring into a sys reset block it gives you access to that reset coming out of the system controller and you can use it to reset your logic so what's going to happen when we program the board if we press the reset switch the leds will turn off um, if for some reason the uh, pll went out of lock uh, then the leds would turn off as well and one thing you can do to save power although we didn't actually um, do it in this design is um, you can expose a, a, a pin so that you could power down the PLL. And if you power down the PLL, the PLL goes out of lock. So that would reset the logic and then you could turn it back on. You might power down the PLL because you want to save power uh, so you could stop the clock and then you could enable it again. So I have all of my ports in here now. So the next thing I need to do is I need to generate the design. And I do that by clicking and click this little symbol right here, generate component, or I could go up under the uh, smart design menu and I could generate the component. And when you generate the component, it's going to connect all these components together. It's going to make, in this case, a Verilog netlist. And when I look over here on the design hierarchy tab, it will show the hierarchy of the design. Um, What's considered the root level is shown in bold font. And you notice I have top and I have all of my components, but LED control is still in bold font because that was what I brought in to the project first. And, and we don't automatically change the root level. Um, if I want to go off and simulate or synthesize, I need to change the root level. So I'm going to right click and I'm going to say set as root. And that's going to tell Libro now that anytime I launch any tools like synthesis or simulation to work from this level and use all of these, the files that are below it. Now to see what Smart Design just did, you can right click on top and you can say open HDL file and you can see I have a Verilog file here and it instantiated my AND2, my Fabric CCC, uh, the LED control block and so on and it makes all of the connections that I had done in the canvas. So you can do things graphically with Smart Design or you could open the editor. I don't have to use Smart Design. I could open an editor and I can make all these uh, edits myself and I could create the, uh, the top.v file using the text editor instead of using Smart Design. But uh, Smart Design can be a little bit faster in some cases. So now that we have our design and it's um, put together, the next step is we could simulate it if we wanted to. Uh, we can also synthesize uh, and then we can make pin assignments and we can run layout. We can program it into the board. Okay, so our design is done, but 
you know, we could have some mistakes and maybe functionally it's not correct. So what we could do is we could simulate the design and we can come over here to the design flow tab and we have a button to verify the pre-synthesis pre-synthesized design and we can run the simulation. Uh, now for purposes of this tutorial I provided a test bench so we can import files before we run the simulator. So I'm going to go out here and I'm going to import um, files and I'm going to look under my source files folder but I'm going to choose um, to look for stimulus files and if I do that I see that there's a test bench that I provided called user test bench v so I'll say open and that will import the test bench into the project and you'll be able to see that under stimulus on the files tab. Uh, the other thing I provided was a run.do, a tickle script um, to run the simulation. It has special commands uh, to run the simulation. So I'm going to import that as well. So I'll say import files once again and I'll come over here and I will say choose simulation files and you see there's a vlog run.do and a vlog wave.do. Uh, I want to import both of those. The vlog run.do has commands for the simulator. The vlog wave.do file is just a wave format file that will make the wave window open in a certain format when we run our simulation. And after you import the simulation files, they'll show up under simulation on the files tab. So we just imported the test bench and uh, the, the tickle scripts, the run.do and wave.do files, they show up under simulation. The test bench shows up under stimulus and the HDL file we imported to start the project shows up under HDL. Um, you'll also see your test benches um, on the stimulus hierarchy tab. Now normally I could right click and I would see a menu item that says set as active stimulus and that would tell the synthesis that would tell Libro that that's the test bench I want to use for simulation but you don't see it here and the reason is there's a little bit of a gotcha if you scroll down and look at the test bench um, in the test bench I called the design fabric underscore top and the instance fabric underscore top underscore zero but what I actually created in smart design I called top when I went through because I was a little careless here so um, I'm gonna just edit the test bench here and I'm gonna change the name of the entity or the module um, to top from fabric top and I'll give the instance name top underscore zero and I'll just save that uh, so now when I do that and I can right click over here So now I can right click after I've saved the file and I can say set as active stimulus. And when I do that, you'll see this little waveform symbol here and that indicates which test bench is going to be used when you run the simulation. Uh, the other thing that you need to look at is I provided this run.do script file. This is a script file for the simulator. But in order to um, have people use the simulator be able to use the simulator uh, that are maybe installing software on their own machines uh, I have a couple of variables in here there's one called projector and there's one called uh, installer uh, projector points to where you did your project and you may need to edit that now you can tell where the project is up here at the top in Libro uh, in my case I created my project on the D drive at micro semi PRJ SF2 fabric so uh, I need to edit this line where it says project dir I'm just going to change this first to the D drive and I called it uh, SF2 fabric so I'll just uh, make a little change right here uh, the other one is you need to point to the installation directory for Libro. Where was Libro installed? This allows the tool to find the simulation libraries that are needed. And um, on my PC, I have the software installed on my D drive um, under MicroSemi Libro 11.5. So uh, both of those variables will need to be changed uh, to match the individual's user's machine. And while we have this open, we can take a look and see what it does. So what this script does is it compiles 
all of the source files for the design um, and then after that it will go through and it will um, uh, force some of the signals high and low and I see in here I also have um, fabric top throughout this this um, uh, script so what I'm going to do is I want to change all of that to top from fabric top so I can just copy this and I can do a replace I'll just say find next and um, uh, I can replace so I have fabric top down here and I'm just going to replace that with top and I'll just say replace all so it went through and it made all these changes so I'm going to save this and uh, I've modified that um, run dot do script so it exactly matches what I created here so now I want to run the simulation uh, before I run the simulation I need to go to the design flow tab and to launch the simulation I can launch it here uh, but before I'm going to do that I want to open the project settings so I'm say project project settings and I'm going to go under do file Libro normally creates an automatic do file to run the simulation but we provided one so what we want to do is we want to uncheck use automatic do file and we'll navigate out to our project and we'll choose the do file that we imported go to micro semi prj and um, look at um, my sf2 fabric and remember that was under the simulation folder so I'll choose simulation and I want to choose vlog run dot do and I'll say open uh, then I'm going to say save and I'm going to say close so I'm pointing to that script that we imported this vlog run dot do we're going to come to design flow tab now we're going to right click and we're going to say open interactively to open the model sim simulator And when the model sim simulator opens, it will run that tickle script. And um, then we should see the simulation start. And we should see signals in the wave window. Now, after I've edited the run.do file, it turns out I have to edit the wave.do file because I have the same issue. I have fabric top in there. So again, I'm going to just replace fabric underscore top with top. So I can copy that and I can come down here and say the uh, in the find, it's already populated with fabric top. I'm going to replace that with top. So I'll say replace all. See all the replacements that were made. And I can say file um, save vlog wave do and then I can just close it if I want to and um, now I'm ready to simulate the design so I can go over here um, to the design flow tab and I could click simulate under verify presynthesis design but before I do that I want to go out to the project settings and I want to make sure that I'm choosing the right do file so normally Libra will have an automatic do file selected um, we create a, a script every time we run Libro, every time we run simulation from Libro. Uh, but I've provided a script in my source file, so I'm going to uncheck that. I'm going to navigate to the simulation folder of the project and select vlog run do, and I'm going to choose save and then close. And now I'm ready to run the simulation. So I can run the simulation by right clicking and saying open interactively. Uh, that will open the model sim simulator. I will see the GUIs. I'll be able to see the wave window. Um, you could say run, but if you say run, the simulation will run in background mode. So then you need a test bench that would capture the data. Um, and um, in our case, we're just going to look and see if the simulation looks like it's working correctly. So you can see that I have a number of signals and dividers in the wave format window here and that's because of the wave.do that we're using. And what this is doing is it's just going to run and we're going to see um, various different um, patterns coming out. We're going to simulate uh, pushing the switch. Down here where it says LED, uh, these are the 
signals that were driving out to the LEDs on the board. And this was written to support multiple boards. And one of the boards only has two LEDs. That's the reason you only see two bits there. Um, and the way it's uh, configured, the LED will be turned on if um, uh, the bit is a zero and it will be turned off if the bit is a one. So we brought another signal out here, this PB switch. So we're simulating a switch being released and a switch being depressed. And as switch is released, we'll see the LEDs. One will be on and one will be off. And they'll sort of toggle back and forth. And if we press the switch, then we want to see them both going together. So we'll see a zero and a three and then a zero and a three. All this does is it lets us kind of get some comfort level in the fact that it looks like functionally the design's correct. Uh, we don't have any unknowns. We're seeing clocks and things. So we can feel pretty good that this looks like it's going to do what we said it won that we wanted it to do. Um, there's still places we could have errors. We could make some mistakes in assigning pins, for example. And we might not get the signals out to the LEDs. But at least it looks like the design is functionally correct. So once we've gone through and done our simulation, we can just close the simulator and say File Quit. Say Yes and our simulation is complete and we're ready to move on to the next step which would be synthesizing the design uh, and then running through layout which synthesis will give us a net list that will take all of the Verilog descriptions that we had in the LED control file things that might describe counters and so on and turn those into gates that can be placed somewhere on the Smart Fusion 2 die and then the layout step is going to be actually taking those gates and placing them somewhere on the die, making all of the interconnects, um, and then coming up with a programming file that tells the software exactly which flash switches have to be programmed to configure the logic correctly and to make the interconnects between the logic and the logic and the IOs and so on. And then we'll program the design. Now I can go through individually and I could say synthesize, compile, and so on, but um, I can also click anywhere in the flow and I can um, run all of the predecessor tools. Now before that I could import a programming file. Before that I could import a pin assignment file. So I'm going to come up here and I'm going to say import files under create constraints and in my source files I brought in a file that's called um, fabrictop.pdc. Uh, so fabrictop.pdc uh, the PDC file is a physical design constraint file. It's a file that um, has pin information. So I can open this in the editor. And if I open it in the editor, um, I'm going to see that there are a number of different pin assignments. And these are all commented out at this time. The pound sign is a comment. So we've provided pin assignments for a number of different boards at MicroSemi cells. And in our case, we're going to target the 090 security kit. And the pin assignments for that one are the same as um, this one right here. The same as the uh, evaluation kit with the 025. So what we want to do is we want to uncomment some of these lines. And we can just select multiple lines and right click. And we can say uncomment selection. So these are the lines we're going to use and what this is going to do is it's going to set one of the IO bank voltages to 3.3 volts. It's going to make pin assignments and it's also going to assign the IO standard for those um, particular IOs. And there's really only three pins we're assigning, the two LED pins and then the push button switch pin. So we can um, save this file. We can close it. We don't need it open. And we're going to come up here and we're going to right click and we're going to say use for compile. So that's going to tell Libro that this constraint file should be used when we run layout. And then I can come down here and rather than clicking on all the steps individually, I could just come to place and route and I could right click and I could say run. And we'll go off and we'll synthesize the design. We'll get an EDIF netlist and then we'll open the layout software and we'll read that, that netlist and we'll make the pin assignments and ultimately we will um, do all the placement and routing. So after we've simulated the design and we know that it's functionally correct, the next step is to synthesize the design. That's going to take the Verilog description we have and output a netlist that can be routed uh, and uh, placed and routed in the SmartFusion 2 silicon. 
Um, and then we want to run place and route, which is the actual step of taking all the cells in the edif net list, placing them somewhere on the die, and then making the interconnects uh, and coming up with the programming file so we can program the flash switches that interconnect the logic together and configures the LUTs in the logic elements for the particular type of gates that we're using. Before I run layout, I'm going to import a an IO constraint file for the pin assignments that we need. There's multiple different ways that we could make pin assignments, but for this tutorial we just decided that we would import a file. So I'm going to click under create constraints, I'm going to click import files, and I'm going to go out to uh, my source files, and I'm going to bring in this fabrictop.pdc file, and I'm going to say open, and right now I'm just going to say no, I don't want to organize my files. Um, I'll see the file shows up, it's going to have a little circle with a line through it, now the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to open it in the editor. So I'll, I'll say open in text editor and I'm going to scroll down and I need to find the section for the particular board that I'm using. And in our case we're using the Smart Fusion 2 Security Evaluation Kit. So I'm going to uncomment these lines. The lines that have a pound are commented and I can select multiple lines and then right click and say uncomment selection. Uh, so what this is going to do is it's going to assign these three ports, LED0, LED1, and the PBSW port, uh, to pins. It shows the pin numbers E1, F4, and L20. And it also sets the I.O. standard. In this case, we're using uh, LV CMOS 33, or a 3.3 volt LV CMOS standard. So I'm going to save the file. Uh, I can close it. I'll come over here, and I'll right-click on the um, Fabric Top PDC and say use for compile and then rather than having to go through and run all the tools individually I can just come all the way down to place a route and say run and the synthesis tool will run and will synthesize the design and then after that we'll run the compile step which will look at the net list that comes in to make sure there's no errors and it will look at our constraints and make sure there's no errors and then we'll run the layout and then the next step is going to be to create the programming file and then program the device and then after we do that we can see the LEDs flashing uh, as we described and as we saw in the simulation. So the layout is now completed and you can see in the design flow window that we have little check marks that will show up so it gives us an indication of where we are in the design flow. Uh, the next step to make this actually run on a board is to generate our programming file or to create the bitstream uh, and then after that we would say run program action. Now with Smart Fusion 2 and Igloo 2 devices we always encrypt the programming file using AES 256 encryption. Uh, it's a security feature it makes it much 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 more difficult for somebody to steal a design and, and copy it or be able to just outright steal uh, somebody's design. Uh, so we'll say uh, configure bitstream and I'll say run and it'll take a, a few minutes while we go through and uh, we encrypt the bitstream. And then when we get to the programming step we're going to uh, take that encrypted bitstream and we're going to decrypt it with an AES decryption engine that's built into all of the parts and if everything checks out okay then we'll go in and we'll program the devices. So you can see there's a little progress bar down at the bottom that indicates where we're at. And this takes a, a minute or so to generate the bitstream. And then when we're finished, we'll configure the board. And by that I mean plug the board in, connect the programmer to the JTAG programming port, make sure that the jumpers are in the proper setting, uh, and then turn the power on the board and we'll say run program action and we'll actually program those flash switches. And once we've programmed the flash switches, uh, that's a non-volatile connection. So we can turn the power off and then turn the power back on and without reprogramming or anything, the, the board and the design is ready to run. Much like if you had an ASIC, uh, except unlike an ASIC, it's reprogrammable. So it's a very interesting technology. Okay, so we can see by the check mark that the generate bitstream tax task is completed and there's also information that shows up in the reports window. So the next step would be to take my board, I'm going to plug the board in, I'm going to plug in the 
programmer. We have a ribbon cable that connects to a 10-pin JTAG header on the board and a USB cable that connects to the PC. So I'm going to plug in my USB cable. Uh, I'm going to turn the board power switch on and I'm going to say run program action. And when I say run program action, it's going to kick off programming. Uh, you'll see that there'll be a message that says, please do not interrupt. It's important with flash devices that you don't disrupt the power when you're programming. If you do, it's possible that the device could be in a state that uh, uh, gets locked up and you can't use it. So now the run program action uh, is completed. I have a little green check mark. I have a log window that tells me that the programming was successful. And on my board, I have two LEDs. Right now, they're toggling back and forth. And if I press the reset switch, the LEDs turn off completely. And if I press the other switch, they both blink on and off together. So that kind of concludes this simple Smart Fusion 2 tutorial for a uh, fabric-only design.